I have a really great pleasure to introduce Professor Mark Hill. Uh, Mark is this junior guy that's going to do something after I leave Berkeley, apparently. And uh, he has done amazing things. And uh, another one of Dave's contributions to this world. Uh, Mark was in uh, shared memory multiprocessors and Dave before anyone else was, I think. And uh, since then, he's gone on to teach at Wisconsin. He has chairs. He chairs the department. He's done a lot of work in cache coherence. He's an ACM and IEEE fellow. Um, boy, Dave, you can be real, really proud of wherever you are sitting here. Oh, there you are. As lots of your students here today, what an incredible legacy. Anyway, uh, Mark wanted me to especially mention that he is the present vice and future chair of the Computer Community Consortium, which you can say more about, but I gather it's an organization to really promote important research in our field. And uh, without further ado, Mark, let's hear what you've got to say today. Thank you so much. Yeah, I just wanted to mention the CCC because it's an example of Dave's uh, tradition of service and you know, giving back to the field is, can be both effective and uh, rewarding. So I was a student at, at the tail end of the RISC project. I actually worked on a, a class project like Christy, uh, which was the RISC II instruction cache, which amazingly enough had 16-bit instructions in it. Uh, and it turned into my first paper, uh, which is now 33 years ago. Uh, unlike Christy, who got to go to Kauai, uh, Dave got to go to Sweden. <laughs> <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about memory, which is one of the most important uh, parts of a computer system. And I guess this is about the future, but a lot of it is about the present, because my experience follows William Gibson, who says the, the future is already here, it's just unevenly distributed. <laughs> and so we can talk about some recent stuff, which I think you know, will be new to you. Uh, my other approach is that I'm going to, instead of being a broad brush, I'm going to sample and give some, a couple of specific ideas, and so hopefully you can take away a few ideas from this talk. So in, inside of a single box, you can classically uh, consider a computer to have compute, memory, and storage. And obviously, networking is important when you go outside the box. And it turns out each of, each of, each of the three of these is having a profound effect on memory. So memory itself is having a profound effect of memory because of the million-fold growth in, in uh, mem memory. Compute is having a profound effect on memory because of the augmentation of uh, CPUs with uh, GPUs. And storage is likely to have a profound effect on memory uh, because of the potential merging of uh, memory and storage, uh, which is not as simple as that, but uh, we'll talk about it. Now, the other thing I want to say is I've been going around. I was amazed how many people have changed where I haven't. <laughs> Okay, first of all, the, the change of uh, memory on memory, okay? So this graph shows the amount of memory uh, that you can purchase for $10,000. So from the 1980s to the present, this has gone from megabytes to terabytes, uh, a really profound change. I mean, there, this is now much larger than the, the storage that was available when I started. Uh, the other thing that's changed is especially how in the server space people use it. They, they can use it for, they, for interactive services that want to access this terabytes, and it's all over the place, and the locality is not as good as some of the traditional memory systems that we've assumed, we architects. So what's an example of that? So this shows um, a memcache D situation where you have a front end which distributes the request to a whole bunch of servers shown with those blue rectangles, and then each server has uh, a large memory, and most of that memory holds an in-memory hash table with which keys and values. So you have terabytes of memory that are holding this uh, table, 
which you certainly don't want to swap, and you don't, you know, it's all read-write anonymous memory. And then in the round-off error, there's a few gigabytes that hold operating system and network state. The other thing that's happened is over the last uh, couple decades, the translation lookaside look buffer sizes have basically been unchanged. Uh, and the reason for this is that on every single load and store, uh, you have to access the translation lookaside buffer before a cache hit. And so Broadwell has 100 entries in its uh, first level translation lookaside buffer and actually does an associative lookup on 12 of them on every you know, little hit. And so this is not easy to scale. One of the things that Dave taught me is that when you spot change and non-uniform change, that that's an opportunity for an uh, inflection point. So the opportunity here comes from the time lost to all these misses. So concentrate on the blue bars here. So those are with four kilobyte pages, and I'll have to take issue with RIS-5. Four kilobyte pages are not going to cut it. Uh, you, can, you can see here where you can lose up to 50% of your execution time or with the micro benchmark a lot more. This can be helped by using the two megabyte and uh, one gigabyte pages of, of x86-64, but there's still a substantial performance loss. And of course, this still matters even though computers are a lot faster because if you can be faster, you can do more or you can buy fewer machines and save money. Um, and so what to do about it? Because it's especially shame use, losing all this performance when you really don't want virtual memory. You got this gigantic in-memory hash table that you most certainly do not want to swap. Okay? And so Chuck Thacker, uh, you know, made an observation in this thing that virtual memory, you know, was designed in a time of scarcity where the memory was really small, maybe smaller than your program and your data, and so it was a good thing to have. Does it make sense anymore? Okay? Well, we actually think it makes sense, but you, you want to be creative about it. Okay, and this comes back to something that Christy was talking about. Of course, to divide and conquer the complexity of computer systems, we've created all these layers. And I was going to make the case that the instruction set architecture is one of the most important layers, but he did that for me. Um, especially in the 20th century, things were moving ahead so fast that you could concentrate on your layer and you were not allowed to touch other layers. I remember like trying to propose a prefetch instruction and people said, no, we can't do that in the instruction set. Okay, especially with the end of Denard's scaling, it, it makes a lot of sense to revisit this and try to, you know, go through the layers. And I guess I would argue and have argued in some white papers that we want to punch through the layers. We don't want to discard the layers because they do serve a useful function, dividing and conquering complexity. So an illustration of punching through the layers can work for this virtual memory problem. So we don't necessarily want to get rid of virtual memory. So this shows a virtual address space VA and a physical address space PA, and those blue things represent pages. There's a lot of stuff paging does for us. Guard pages on stacks, copy on write, uh, map files. You know, you don't want to rewrite Linux in order to get 50% more performance. It's not worth it. Okay, but what can we can do is we can bypass paging often. So one design we have, and there's you know better work out there now, uh, is to add three registers next to the TLB, which do a base limit check and then do an addition. Uh, in this case, a negative value, which calculates the where things are in memory with no possibility of a TLB miss, and you can use that for almost all your memory. And this is a, a small punch through, and well. Could something like this possibly work? Um, well, you can see its performance overhead in the purple bars, where I have con conveniently put the arrows pointing down because there's sort of no overhead left. And that's because like 99% of the former TLB misses went to that region, the key value store, for example, that had little locality. And we're not done yet, as uh, people observed with the transitions to non-volatile memory, uh, not only do we need the address space expanded, but we're going to have to probably rethink how we do address translation, uh, because it's not clear that the current method will scale. The other thing that's had a big effect on, uh, on, uh, on memory is processing. So we've had this wonderful trend to taking graphics process processing units, GPUs, and applying them to um, more general compute problems. Uh, great work from NVIDIA and elsewhere. Key thing here is that these things are all designed for throughput, and you know that little 
rectangle over there represents a scalar, and there's, there's in some sense hierarchical vectors and threads where some things are closer to each other. And the whole thing is designed for throughput, not just the processors, but also the memory. We'll show a picture of that next. And it's all in a scoped nature, that's the things which are in a closer scope are closer to you, and you should structure your, com your computation in that fashion. So how's this going to affect memory? Well, initially, GPUs used memory that was completely separate from the host memory. Um, you know, going forward, there's challenges with that. In particular, that memory was small. And also, if we want to expand the viable programs, you want to sort of allow a richer, uh, richer data structures. You know, copying a dense array is quite easy, but taking a, a data structure that has lots of pointers and transforming it and copying and swizzling the pointers is sort of easy in theory and hard in practice. So if this is all going to be together, you know, what's going to happen with things like coherence and, and with these scopes? Well, let's just look at the GPU hardware for a little bit. So this shows a picture of GPU hardware with the compute units on the bottom going up toward the last level cache. And what happens in a lot of cases is that there's just, there's a whole bunch of writes that you write through. And uh, even though the L1 and L2 here are, you know, they look like caches, they're really closer to coalescing write buffers. Uh, because the amount of state that you have per data item or thread is very small. Okay, and so what turns out that this then ends up being sort of a poor mismatch for the kind of coherence that uh, we invented in the Spur project and elsewhere and the write back caches of a CPU. So if you remember the way coherence works for writes is if you want to write something, you first have to bring the block in really close to you and then you can write it. Well, that doesn't make sense if you're going to just stream and often you don't read what you write very quickly, in part because GPUs have scratch pads. So what are we going to do about this? We have to make sense. So are we going to have memory coherence as previously defined? Um, a key thing to remember is that coherence is not the end. So the idea of coherence was to make the caches invisible. Once you make the caches invisible, what are you left with? Well, you're left with the memory consistency model. And so to make GPUs work, we want to return back to the to memory consistency models. Since some of you uh, may have only studied these in school or they were invented after you were in school, I'll do a quickie tutorial here. Uh, so we've got two threads, and they're both trying to manipulate the uh, top of stack with those red references. And the idea of sequential consistency says that you're going it's lo it logically looks like there's a total memory order, and the references of the threads just interleave in this order in some way. And the hardware may be super complicated, but the programmer can use this simple model. Okay, well, that's great, except no hardware actually implements that today. Uh, also, no software actually works like this. If you look at this, uh, this particular interleaving will result in a lost update on your stack data structure. And so what people actually do is they have synchronization to make sense of things, such as you can have locks here. And what the locks will do is that um, you know, either the first thread will get the lock and do all its memory references and then the second, or it may be in the other order, but they're not actually interleaved, okay? An observation was made uh, many years ago now that uh, if you're actually in this critical section, others are not looking. So maybe you can have your cake and eat it too. And that's the idea of sequential consistency for data race free. So if your program is protected properly by synchronization, uh, then in the critical section, others can't be observing what you're doing, so why don't you do it out of order and be fast? Okay, and we can have our cake and eat it too. Oops. All right, so this is nice, uh, and this is what happened on the CPU side. So Leslie Lamport invented uh, sequential consistency in 1979. Srita Adve and I define SC for data race free in 1990. The Stanford work with Hennessy and others properly labeled is very similar. A mere 15 to 18 years later, uh, Java and C++ adopted the same approach, and basically we got things under control in uh, three decades. <clears throat> so what we're hoping for is can we do the GPU world faster, okay? And one of the principal problems with that is that uh, the GPUs have these scopes. So, you know, one scope, uh, and the scopes, you're, it's faster, right? So one scope includes this sort of level one thing, another one a level two, another potentially the whole system. 
And you want to structure your things so that most of, more of your communication is closer in these scopes. And I didn't invent these scopes. These scopes, uh, you know, they were in the hardware manuals of NVIDIA and ATI in inscrutable ways for a long time. We're just trying to make sort of higher level sense of them. Okay? And there's been some, some really nice progress here. So uh, we helped define uh, sequential consistency for heterogeneous race free. I won't go into the details, but the basic idea is no data races like before, but also the synchronization has to have enough scope. Turns out enough is uh, a lot harder to define than uh, is appropriate here. And I'm very bullish about this for two reasons. I'm going to have on the slide which is the heterogeneous system architecture, uh, a consortium of companies including ARM and AMD, uh, adopted this a year later. And secondly, if you understand academia, uh, is this was already attacked one year later, okay, by my former student, Sarita Adve, so. And, but we're not done here because, you know, this is CPUs and GPUs, and going forward, there's gonna be systems with, uh, all kinds of accelerators. And the right way to handle this for architects is not yet known, but we, we want to keep up the principles that uh, even though we have complicated interfaces, we try to have as simple uh, implementations, we try to have as simple as possible interfaces. Okay, so the final thing is how does storage going to affect memory? This is a shorter section. Okay, so classically, um, if you talk about a single box, uh, there's been many technologies for doing compute, from uh, vacuum tubes to discrete transistors to chips of many sizes. There's been many memories technologies from Williams tubes to uh, core to uh, DRAM, and memory storage technologies uh, from drums to disks. And now we're at a, a very interesting point where you know, people are proposing a convergence. Uh, now, what happens with these convergences is that they start out with a tremendous amount of hype uh, that is it's going to be better, faster, stronger in every way, but eventually, you know, the truth will out and many th interesting things will happen. I kind of agree with Garth. I don't think this will necessarily have an effect on, you know, the more distant, bigger storage, but it's going to have a big effect on the memory hierarchy, in my judgment. And I'll, I'm just going to characterize this kind of simple with a simple model here, you can think about using the non-volatility two ways. Uh, one, by because of surprise, you get turned off, and the other, by design. Um, so what's the surprise stuff? Surprise is a crash. Every time you, you see you got non-volatility, you're tempted to survive crashes. And, uh, you know, so we have this memory order that we already defined, and so it would seem like it's pretty easy to just define a crash. We'll just say, um, keep everything in order. But, you know, our whole systems, our memory systems are designed without keeping things in order. So if you store a value and then you indicate that it's valid and you put it in your right back cache, that right back cache is certainly allowed to replace the, um, the valid flag first, okay, and now you have a crash and in memory you have the assertion that something is valid without the value, okay. And so to make this work better, we need to define what should happen. And, you know, there have been nice steps forward in academia, uh, Wenich and others out of Michigan, defining a persistency order. Uh, and the idea is, is that you do things in memory, but then you also say how things happen to, when, they, when they're guaranteed to be persistent, okay? And uh, there's a strict persistency model and a relaxed persistency model, and this is actually, I think, really good progress. But sort of, as an industry, we're not there yet. Uh, industry is a long ways away. Um, let's see, so this is, I won't name the company, but uh, pcommit is about uh, putting things in persistent memory. If pcommit is executed after a store to persistent memory in a range that is accepted to memory, a store becomes persistent when the pcommit becomes globally visible. Okay, what's accepted to memory? While all stored memory operands are eventually accepted to memory, uh, that text, um, that text here explains uh, when things are actually accepted to memory. And in my judgment, this is not okay. It's too complicated and it's too uh, informal. And so I think to get a deeper understanding, we have to get this together. We have to actually understand what needs to be durable. And of course, what we want is to figure out what is absolutely necessary to make durable and not gratuitously flush things uh, because that costs time. 
Okay, so finally, the other, or everyone, when you hear non-volatile memory, everybody thinks about crashes immediately. But I think a really important way going forward is powering off by design using prediction. So the idea here is to improve energy efficiency because since your state is in, non, in a non-volatile fashion, you can, um, you can power off more often. So I, I want us to get good at briefly doing nothing. Okay, and so here's a picture, you're doing it, that's a long idle time, that's kind of easy to do. Uh, but going forward, we like to handle uh, much, much briefer idle times because, you know, we could get a factor of, I don't know, an integer factor of energy efficiency if we can power off efficiently. Okay, now this is not easy. It's going to take work at multiple levels. The circuit work might be the toughest, and I see Mark Horowitz is here. He may tell me that the circuit work is impossible, but I, I have a higher opinion of him. <clears throat> So I say this for last because I think it's interesting and also it gives me an opportunity to tell you, uh, to characterize this work in advice that Patterson never gave me, which is the key to this is to do nothing well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. And I have to say, listening to your talk, uh, you gave me a, an interesting thought. As humans, in what we do and in our work, we seek to externalize our internal realities into the world. As engineers, unfortunately, the world talks back to us, <laughs> as it doesn't necessarily in the liberal arts. You know, the bridge falls down or the computer crashes. And as Dave students, like, especially this talk we just heard, we actually listen to what the world says. So, are there any questions for Mark? It's hard to see, yeah. it's hard Hi. To see with the lights. Hi. Yeah. So, uh, we heard your perspective on, on hardware, but from a point of view of a software, uh, I have any idea of what changes the non-volatile memory model will bring and how we are going to overcome them? Uh, well, the full answer to that is, is very long. Uh, of course, a lot of it has to do with that the, the software for dealing with storage has traditionally um, known that it was accessing a disk. And if you got 10 milliseconds to access the disk, it's okay if you futz around for uh, one millisecond, especially if it's overlapped with the disk access. Uh, and so things are going to have to get a lot lighter in the virtual memory system. And there's also going to be a I believe some kind of merging of the file system work uh, with virtual memory, and you know, Ramsey and Andrea, my colleagues, uh, know more, much more about that than I do. Uh, but the layer is very fat because you, you had the time; it was the right thing to do. I also think there's a gigantic problem with address translation, right? You just can't. If we're going to access petabytes, you're not going to do it with those hundred entry TLBs. And Kim, Kim will give you the right answers. <laughs> Looks like John has a question. Hi, hi, John Osterhout from Stanford. Uh, on your topic number three, it seems like the possibility of power going out at an inconvenient time presents the possibility of a tremendous amount of additional complexity. Why not simply fix that problem at its source? As long as you have enough power that you can find out when you're losing power and flush your caches to memory, then don't all these issues about persistency go away? It seems like that's a much simpler solution. Um, so this is kind of an interesting thing. I, I thought the problem of power going away was going to die, but people who build big systems seem to be very concerned about it. And I, I completely agree with you. It does seem reasonable to have supercapacitors and various other backups so that you can, you know, I mean, how long does it take, right? 15 seconds can, can go a long way. Unless, of course, you have to unload a uh, you know, terabyte of memory. But if, if you're thinking about just the last level cache that has to be dumped to memory, most power supplies even give you on the order of, I think, 5 to 10 milliseconds of advanced notice of power going out. Is that enough to flush your last level cache? <clears throat> that could be enough to uh, flush your last level cache if we get better at finding the dirty data in your last level cache, or we sometimes put it out a little earlier. 
Because walking the whole thing to find things is not so easy. I mean, it's easy, it's just, it's fairly sequential. So Mark, I'd like to ask you a little uh, oral prelim question. Um, so when you have a cache that you cannot make bigger because of circuit problems, uh, are there any possible solutions to improving the effective TLB refill time? Yeah, so, so no, this, it's not the, you can uh, fill the effective real time by having a second level TLB, which of course these systems are doing, but it, uh, it's still not scaling well enough, right? The, the current le level two TLBs are uh, like 512 uh, entries or so. And uh, I'm, I'm not convinced that the right solution to this is to have you know, a third level of TLB. It seems to me that the full power of four kilobyte random paging anywhere is totally overkill for how we're trying to use these vast memories today. In the 80s, uh, there was a graduate student here who did a thesis which showed that uh, direct map caches beat uh, set associative. His uh, one-liner was big and dumb is better. He was a tall fellow, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> anyway, that, at the time it occurred to me that, that, a, that a physical memory was a cache for, for virtual memory and wondered if it would if it would work as well for, um, for if you could, if the, if the same logic would apply to, go, to going from just to, to memory, if you just shouldn't directly map uh, phys virtual memory. Concluded at the time that it was a bad idea because of the miss penalties. I wonder with bigger memories and potentially lower miss penalties uh, if that's now changed. Right, so of course Rick was referring to uh, my thesis, which it was subtitled, Big and Dumb is Better, and I want to assert that wasn't referring to me, but my <laughs> ideas. <clears throat> so it's definitely possible. I mean, back when you, know, you were swapping to disk, it was an absolutely absurd idea. Um, if you can swap much faster, it's possible, although the key thing is we still want to make sure, well, I'll tell you about another really interesting piece of work where somebody was looking at a chip stack cache, which was a very large cache that was behind the whole hierarchy, and, but it was, in, it was done with DRAM, and so it was very expensive to do associative logic there. And what they found basically was, actually you could make that cache direct mapped because there were all these caches in front of it. Essentially, uh, you know, Jopi's uh, victim caches were in front of it instead of behind it. And so direct mapping uh, made sense, so. Could be. Uh, was there one question in the back row? Okay, last question. Go ahead. All right, Eric Brewer, Berkeley and Google. I have so many thoughts I'd love to share. I don't have time, but the uh, three things that Google's been thinking about, and you don't have to answer all three, but they're, they're challenges for non-volatility. Uh, one is that uh, local non-volatility is not the same as durability. Yep. Right. Uh, the second problem we tend to have is that things that are durable need encryption under many different laws that memory does not need, and that usually means a per user key, which is hard. And the third one is that historically, when we write from memory to storage, we do it through a kind of a serialization process that's very robust versus a read and write process where wild writes go directly to storage and become permanent. And that seems like a huge problem for any kind of direct use of, of, of non-volatility. So those are easy questions. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, I'll just touch on a couple of those. You know, Peter Chen has done some nice, Peter's here, right? He's done some nice work on how you can have things in your, your physical address space and yet still sort of protect them against stray rights and things like that. I think that kind of stuff's gonna be revisited. I think you're absolutely right about the fact that durable is a, uh, it's a concept. It means it's, it's, it's secure enough. And in, in the, today's modern systems, stored in one non-volatile place is not durable. Uh, so it's possible, and coupling with John said, that the uh, persistency models become um, less important. Uh, I also think that's interesting, it, it, there's the chance that DRAM doesn't improve enough and we switch to a memory technology and use it only in a volatile way despite the fact that it's non-volatile. 
right? That's just the property that uh, is there, but we're not particularly exploiting. So we will see. Okay, we better wind up. Thanks, Mark. <laughs>